to all today as we mark the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. My name is Yara Shafani and I am the Executive Director of Canadian Friends of Seville. I will be moderating tonight's lecture for the first portion of the evening. So I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The land that we gather on has been inhabited continuously for over 15,000 years. It is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. It is also the land of the Patun and Huron Wendat peoples, and most recently, the territory of the Mississauguas of the New Credit First Nation. It is also the land of the One Dish, One Spoon, Wampum Belt covenants between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and other nations to share the resources and the caretaking of this land. Toronto, or Tkaranto, is a home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to be welcomed on this land, but we also realize that our presence on this land is the outcome of colonization. And while we are here today discussing the colonization and occupation of Palestine, we must also discuss the colonization and occupation of Turtle Island. I've been thinking a lot about land acknowledgements lately. They have been the topic of conversations between friends and coworkers. They have popped up as a topic in online opinion pieces, some more critical than others. Ultimately, the criticism is quite clear. Acknowledging the land has become a symbolic gesture, something that is checked off the to-do list in an evening agenda. After spending some time engaging with these critiques, I thought to myself, how would I feel to learn that today at a university in Tel Aviv, an event began with a land acknowledgement that included a quick run through of a few Palestinian cities, perhaps some were mispronounced, and as the lecture wrapped up, students, academics, citizens went home and continued on with their lives, doing nothing to change the reality of continued colonization and occupation. Colonization is not a past occurrence. It is an ongoing system, and acknowledging the land and treaties simply isn't enough. We need to ask ourselves, how do we show solidarity with indigenous people on Turtle Island and indigenous Palestinians? Do our feminist movements fight for justice for the missing and murdered indigenous women? Do we make the connections between occupation and patriarchy? Do our climate movements acknowledge the First Nations as the very people, very first people, who began the fight against climate change? Do they fight for the justice of First Nations whose land and health have been threatened by pipelines built intentionally upstream? As we speak about decolonization today and about decolonizing our movements, our language, our arts, those are the things that come to mind. Costly solidarity does not demand that we don't make these acknowledgements or that we never make a mistake when pronouncing names, cities, or treaties. It does, however, demand that we take the time to really learn not only the past, but also the present. It demands that we do more than rush through the motions and check the boxes. Costly solidarity demands that we commit to transformative politics and work towards a shared liberation. To welcome you to the college, I would like to introduce our gracious host, Michelle Voss Roberts, principal of Emmanuel College. Thank you, Yara, for that thoughtful reflection on the land. My name is Michelle Voss Roberts. I'm the principal at Emanuel, and I'm really delighted to welcome all of you to our campus tonight. I'll just say a few words about Emanuel College um, for those of you who may be new to our community. We're historically a, a theological school of the United Church of Canada, training ministers for um, over 90 years. And in recent decades, we've also become a multi-religious theological school. Our Master of Pastoral Studies program has streams for Christian, Muslim, and Buddhist students to help them to integrate wisdom uh, from their own religious traditions with practices of psycho-spiritual care. 
And um, we are, we've been so enriched by the diversity of this group and others coming to um, utilize the resources of the University of Toronto to um, weave in still more um, uh, religious and um, wisdom traditions into their practice. If you'd like to know more about the programs, um, and we have a number of different academic programs, um, at, including at the doctoral level, um, please take a look at our table outside in the lobby. I'd like to also to um, just to give you a couple of updates of recent happenings at Emmanuel. Um, we have um, some new faces and, um, and people in new positions. We've um, uh, been in a, in a period of um, saying goodbye to some professors who are retiring and also welcoming new professors, one of whom is here tonight. Um, I just want to introduce you to uh, Professor Nestor Medina. You want to wave? There he is. Um, he, uh, he is our um, assistant professor of ethics and has a very strong background in liberation theologies. And so I'm glad to see you here tonight. Uh, I'd also like to introduce you to someone who may be a familiar face, and that's um, Sean um, Houston. Is it Houston? I'm sorry. <laughs> I've known Sean only for. <laughs> Anyway, Sean Houston um, is integral to our office and recently, just in the last uh, couple of weeks, has taken up the position as um, events and media coordinator for the college, which means that he's the face of the Center for Religion and its Contexts. Um, this uh, lecture tonight is a function of the Center. And um, if any of you are interested in being on a mailing list and learning more about our events, um, it might be good to give your information to him. Uh, we have um, a really wonderful lineup, including um, a, a, in the works uh, a panel on um, refugee mental health related to our, um, our uh, pastoral theology program. So um, please um, introduce yourself after the panel, be interested in, in meeting all of you. Um, and uh, I'll just conclude with a word of thanks. There are many organizations that have endorsed this event tonight um, and to bring us all together and a special thanks of course to the Canadian Friends of Sabeel and also to the Graff family. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, okay, so before we jump into today's lecture, I would like to tell you a little bit about Canadian Friends of Sabeel. And bear with me for a second. There we go. Okay, so the Canadian Friends of Sabeel, hmm, I think it's just moving on its own. So the Canadian Friends of Sabeel Project is committed to standing in solidarity with Palestinians and raising awareness in Canada, particularly within the Christian church and broader, Christ, broader Christian communities. Of course, we identify the problem uh, as Israeli colonization and occupation, but as Christians, we identify a specific problem within our communities, which is the prevalence of Christian support for Israeli Zionism. Christian Zionism hinders the Christian church from being the voice of justice that it is called to be on. Our work is a direct response to this. The call that we are responding to is a call from Palestinian Christians who call on the church to engage in costly solidarity for truth, peace, justice, and reconciliation. So uh, last year we raised, um, we actually called um, on you uh, to help us raise funds for Gaza's Al-Ahli Hospital, for solar panels at the Al-Ahli Hospital. You can read more about this project and the installation of the panels in your envelopes. Um, we recently received updates about the progress of the installations and a few photos that I would like to share here with you from Al-Ahli. So the installation of the solar panels is well underway. I'll leave this here for a minute. 
So Dr. Tarek Lubani, who spoke to us last year, went to Al Ahli in September and reported back that they have covered almost all of their electricity needs. He noted, quote, the first phase of this work has decreased Al Ahli's electricity spending from 150,000 USD, 40,000 for grid power and 11, 1,100,000 for diesel to 80,000 USD, 25,000 for grid power and 55,000 for diesel. These costs will decrease to almost zero with the second phase of this project. This was not possible without you and your generosity, and I would just like to say a warm thank you. Um, this year we are fundraising for our program so that we can continue to put together initiatives, set up educational lectures, and organize to keep Palestine in the heart of Christians and Canadians more broadly. All of the work that we do is made possible through small private donations. If you would like to donate to our organization, there is a slip um, and an envelope in your package that can be filled. Thank you so much. I won't take too long to talk about CFOS programs, but I will talk about this program because it's a great one and it is coming up um, actually starting next week. Um, and so we are always working on a variety of initiatives and I would like to spotlight this one, um, which is actually the play written by our guest speaker tonight, Sama Sabawi. Tales of a City by the Sea is an award-winning play. It is the unique and poetic journey into the lives of ordinary people struggling to find hope and love in areas affected by war and violence. Jamana, a Palestinian woman who lives in the Shati refugee camp in Gaza, falls in love with Rami, an American-born Palestinian medical doctor and activist who arrives on the Free Gaza boats in August 2008. Their love is met with many challenges, including Israel's assault on Gaza during the winter of 2008, forcing Rami to make incredible, decision, incredible decisions, the least of which is to take a dangerous journey through the underground tunnels that connect Gaza to Egypt. The play will be premiering in Toronto at Theatre Pass Marai on December 6th, so next week, um, and will be running for nine days. Information about how to buy tickets or how to volunteer on one of the nights can be found on our website and at our CFOS table outside. So directing the play, we have Rahaf Basha, uh, who is in her final year, of, you know, final year at the University of Toronto, specializing in theater and performance studies while minoring in psychology. I'm really excited to introduce Rahaf because she is going to be um, the moderator of the Q&A portion of this lecture where she'll be introduced. We have Rahaf. where she'll be engaging in a dialogue with Sama and then moderating the Q&A. Um, so I'll just give a little brief bio about Rahaf, um, which is that the majority of her training in the past has revolved around acting, including the opportunity to be a part of Toronto's Soul Pepper Theatre Company's City Youth Academy program in 2015. She has been involved in various theater conferences and workshops such as the LAMDA and has acted in multiple productions around UFT's campus. Rahaf has made her, made her direct, direct, directorial debut with Tales of a City by the Sea as 2008 as part of her capstone advanced directing course. This play personally resonates with her identity as a Palestinian coming from exiled, from exiled refugees. She is excited to be putting the play up once more at Theater Pass Marai with a new vision and a new creative team. Thank you, Rahaf, for all of your work and thank you for joining us tonight. So lastly, I'd like to introduce Robert um, Asli, who is the chair of Canadian Friends of Seville to welcome you um, and to welcome our speaker. I'd like to welcome all of you then to the James Graff Memorial Lecture. As you can see in some of the slides, our, our formal name is Nekef Sabil Canada, and we're known as Canadian Friends of Sabil. Nekef was an organization started by James Graff. And uh, I, J Jim was, uh, was a mentor of mine. It was the mentor of mine in this work, and I, I had a deep love for Jim. Jim had, though, two loves in his life. His first love was his wife, Ida, and Ida's here. Um, thank you uh, once again for coming, and great to see you, Ida. Jim's second love 
was Palestinian solidarity and activism. When I used to go to New York to the UN with Jim uh, as part of an official delegation a couple of times every year, and annually there would be a gathering of 200 or so organizations uh, at the UN, NGOs concerned with Palestine, not only did everybody know Jim, but they recognized him in North America when, as the person who, when there were very few non-Palestinian NGOs, being the leader of the movement. They used to call him the grandfather of the movement, and that's why uh, for many years they kept him as vice chair, which is the highest role a Canadian uh, could, uh, uh, could establish at, um, at the UN uh, Committee for NGOs. Jim's work was unbelievable through his uh, organization, NECAF, which eventually uh, Canadian Friends of Sabil merged with. And tonight we are having the 12th annual lecture in memory of him. Both Jim and Ida were professors here at Victoria College, which is uh, Emmanuel is part of Victoria, and uh, they, they were both professors here, and so it's a special privilege to have the lecture once again here, the annual James Graff Memorial Lecture in the very chapel where uh, Jim's funeral service was held. And so this is um, uh, quite specially a memorial lecture uh, in memory of, uh, of Jim's great work. Uh, on Palestine. I'd like to introduce our 12th annual James Graff Memorial Lecture, Sama Sabawi. Now, I've known Sama for, um, uh, let, let me start by saying since she was a kid, for three decades. Okay. Uh, and, um, uh, and her husband, Manir. Manir, do you want to just wave, stand up? Thank you. For, uh, for three decades and their, um, uh, their personal friendship uh, with me in the, in the um, 23 years that they, they, they lived with in Ottawa uh, has, has been essential to my, um, uh, to my joy in life. And so I know Sama uh, as a friend and it's been wonderful to watch her blossom in her work on Palestine. And a lot of this happened while she was in Ottawa, but even more so in the last six or seven years since she moved to Australia. And Paul Saban now is um, uh, a multi-award winning playwright, author, poet, and political commentator. And you can see um, a lot of her commentary on, uh, on YouTube. Her most recent play, was selected for the Melbourne Theatre Company's 2018 Cybic Electric season, and its 2019 sold-out Melbourne premiere was received with high critical acclaim. Her play Tales of a City by the Sea, which, as Yara mentioned, uh, it begins next uh, a week, a week Friday, uh, won two drama Victoria Awards and was nominated for the Green Room Award for Best Independent Production, which is a very prestigious award in Australia. It's sold out at all 70 of its shows in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Kuala Lumpur, Palestine, and hopefully next week in Toronto. I see Rahaf crossing her fingers for that. Let me say that one of the reasons we decided as Canadian Friends of Sibyl to have tales come to Toronto is because it's a wonderful, soft introduction to Palestinian issues. It's a place that, without provoking arguments at the dinner table afterwards, you can bring your friends. You can invite your friends who have no experience of Palestine, no knowledge of it. And so I, I hope you'll consider coming and bringing people that you know. Both of these plays were selected for the Victoria Curriculum of Education Drama Playlist, 
bringing Australian stories from Palestine and from the Arab world. Sama has co-edited co Double Exposure, plays of the Jewish and Palestinian diaspora and is the winner of the Patrick O'Neill Award. And she co-authored Remember My Name, which is the winner of the Palestinian Book Award. She's also a, a policy advisor for leading Palestinian think tanks and the policy network Al Shabaka, and a former cultural ambassador for the Melbourne Theatre Company and multi Multicultural Arts uh, in Victoria, and a PhD candidate at Victoria University who just submitted her thesis before she came here. Yeah, that's a, uh, a big achievement. And news was just leaked this morning, which I cannot share with you. Um, so I'm not gonna share the details of it because it's embargoed until Monday that um, uh, by uh, a government, a national government, that uh, her most recent play, Them, is up for something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, check your news uh, feed on Monday. Just Google Sama Sabawi. But I, I, I mean, these these, incre these achievements uh, by Sama uh, with um, uh, the support of Manir have, are just amazing, uh, uh, really remarkable. And I, I should mention, perhaps um, for her, one of her most important important achievements is that she has three wonderful children um, who are left behind in Australia. So thank you very much, Sama. Big children, big, children. <laughs> big children, and uh, three grandkids as well. Uh, so thank you very Sama for coming all the way from Australia to uh, to be with us this evening. Please. Thank you very much for this introduction, Robert. And I knew that organizing your um, Canadian Friends of Sibyl Gmail inbox 25, 30 years ago was gonna pay off, finally. <laughs> um, all right, uh, thank you for, for uh, Yara as well for the important land acknowledgement and for this reminder that while we come from colonized land, here we are the benefactors of colonialism. Um, and we are here at the expense of the colonization of this country's indigenous peoples. I think I agree with you that for some, these acknowledgements may actually seem to be a matter of ceremonial obligation. Uh, but I, I really believe that they are indeed acts of affirmation for the rights of the indigenous peoples and a reminder really of the horror of colonization and settler colonialism. And I think my way of remedying going a little bit beyond the ceremonial obligation part is, is to try to find something that learn something about the, the peoples whose land we're on and to raise awareness about one issue at least. And so for the today I'd like to talk to you about one of the many issues that face uh, the First Nations people in, in this land. And I mean, there are so many that it seems at times overwhelming. The World Health Organization has recently made the implicit recognition um, of the connection between colonization and um, poor indigenous health, which is of course intricately connected to all the other issues, inadequate housing and overcrowded poor living conditions connected to lower levels of education, lower income, higher unemployment, higher incarceration rates, higher death rates amongst children, higher um, rates of suicide, and the list goes on and on. Nearly half of the youth incarcerated in Canada are indigenous. The Globe and Mail has reported last year that data released by Statistics Canada in 2017 shows that the Aboriginal youth made up 46% of admissions to correctional services, even though they only make up 8% of the youth population. These figures are staggering. 
So as a victim of Israel's vicious but failing settler colonialist project, I too want to echo Yara's acknowledgement to land. And I pledge my support and my solidarity to the struggle of Canada's First Nations. Mahmoud Darwish has famously said, whoever writes his story will inherit the land of words and pass and possess meaning entirely. And so for decades, Palestinians have been writing their stories. They have been writing for their lives. They have been writing for their freedom and for their existence. And I have learned as a Palestinian writer that for my words to have any real impact, they must exhibit the very freedom that they speak of and that they seek to achieve. I have learned the importance of decolonizing my words, my research methods, and my frames of references, and my activism. And what this really means in practical terms is that I have learned to write and to speak unapologetically my narrative, my story, my words. To borrow from the indigenous researcher Linda Tuhuai Smith, I have learned to write from the vantage point of the colonized. I'm not interested in spending any time explaining or defending the actions of the colonizers. For the longest time, I remember being told that my work needed to be balanced to include the point of view of the other. And I'm reminded of something that Ghassan Kanafani said, if any of you have seen that famous interview on YouTube, where uh, a reporter asks Ghassan Kanafani, why don't you engage with the Israelis in talks? And Ghassan Kanafani says, you mean a conversation between the sword and the neck? There is no balance between colonizer and colonized, oppressor and oppressed, and my neck will never feel that it needs to make excuses for the sword that is trying to sever it. So my first poem tonight is just about that. It's called Words. I've been down this road before. Someone tries to teach me how to use words that will open doors offering me tips in communication. Instead of saying apartheid, try a system of segregation. Downplay the Nakba and focus more on the occupation. And if you're writing a statement, be sure you start each paragraph with clear support for the two-state solution. And don't forget to end it with a Hamas condemnation. <laughs> Words. I stand dispossessed. No Congress behind me. No statesmen surround me. No lobby to breathe hellfire. No media eager to appease. No three-ring circus of intellectual jesters, academic clowns, and policy experts who truly do not see the big elephant in the tent. No legal acrobats dance for me on a thin robe of decency. No politicians juggle oppression and human rights on my behalf. No trips to boost careers for MPs and their wives. No radio broadcasts, no propaganda movies, no myths, no lies, no Hasbro nights, no army, no country. Not even one leader to believe in. All I have are my words to tell my story, my voice to demand justice, and you're telling me my language is too strong. You may perfect the skill of delusion, the talent of denial. You may express regret and lament and cry tears of indignation, and you may insist you're on my side, but without naming the crimes they commit, without saying, ethnic cleansing and apartheid, your words ring hollow. So let me hold on to my words. I use them sparingly. I utter one word and a house is resurrected from memory on a hill in Palestine. I utter another 
and I'm in a courtyard under a sycamore tree and another and the scent of jasmine fills the air. Words lift me up from despair and take me home. Words disarm tyrants, bring down empires and reveal all that the oppressors wish to conceal. My humanity. I stand dispossessed of everything but my words. They are words of truth, of fire and steel. I use them deliberately, not to incite hatred, not to frighten, but to lighten up this darkness that has torn me into 11 million pieces and scattered me across the earth. Words tell my story. Nakba. Naksa, forced exile, ethnic cleansing, apartheid, words carefully chosen and purposely uttered. These are the words that lay the foundation for the language of my liberation. Now, Palestinians have relied mostly, relied mostly on oral sources in order to document their experiences prior to, during, and in the period that followed the establishment of Israel in 1948, an event that Palestinians call Al-Nakba or the catastrophe, a time when Jewish gang terror, terrorized and ethnically cleansed more than 400 Palestinian villages and towns forcing 750,000 Palestinians, that's two thirds of the Palestinian population into exile, dispersed and forever stateless. Israel's deliberate and systematic erasure of the Palestinian presence on the land included the destruction of all Palestinian centralized state institutions and official archives. Nur Masalha, who is one of the most prominent analysts and historians of modern Palestine spent years researching Palestinian history and culture, landscape, toponymy, and geography. And he said that, um, and I'm gonna quote him directly, he wrote that much of the Palestinian material culture, landscape, toponymy, and geography, which had survived the Latin Crusades were obliterated by the Israeli state. I mean, that is the massive size of the attack and the looting that was taking place of Palestine. But after more than 70 years of attacks on Palestinian presence, culture, and identity, Israel's settler colonial project has not succeeded. And I have a prediction to make here tonight. It will not succeed ever. Predicated on the ethnic superiority of Jews over non-Jewish indigenous peoples of the land, it is only a matter of time for this project to implode upon itself. It is untenable to think that you can implement such grave injustices indefinitely. But today the UN estimates that there are over 5 million Palestinian refugees who are still stateless in refugee camps most of them ravaged by wars in Syria, Lebanon, and in the occupied territories. In the West Bank, Palestinians are under direct Israeli military rule, and they suffer daily incursions, arbitrary arrests, home demolitions, land confiscations, travel restrictions, and violence, horrific violence. Palestinians who are citizens of Israel have more than 50 laws of discrimination aimed against them. And Palestinians in Gaza still survive, are surviving a 12-year siege that has been described by UN experts as illegal and inhumane. But resistance has never waned, not for one day. Resistance in Palestine continues and will continue until freedom. And so my next poem is for the people of Gaza and it's called Song of the Besieged. 
The UN declared Gaza unlivable, so the people of Gaza declared that life beyond livability is inevitable. They rattled their cage and they sang this song. The UN said Gaza was unlivable, but life beyond livability in Gaza is inevitable, like the rainfall and the winter storms. Life inside the walls is ferocious. Like dandelion, it grows. It powers through like inexorable love, like an irresistible kiss like the birthing of new life beyond the statistics of death. Life beyond livability in Gaza is inevitable, like the sunrise, predictable like the movement of the tides, invincible like flowers in the desert, unassailable like a smile on the lips of the beloved. Unequivocal, like a word that splits bullets in halves. Indomitable, like a revolutionary march. Unstoppable, like the earth's rotation. Formidable, like a fist in the face of occupation. Undeniable, like destiny, like freedom from tyranny like justice for the refugees. So listen carefully. Two million hearts are beating off rhythm. There is no harmony beyond livability, only the inevitable. Beware the inevitable. Almost two-thirds of the Palestinian population are outside the homeland, pushed into the blank spaces of erasure, denied their right to return to their homes, and many times also denied their voice and their narrative in their new homes. As a writer in exile, I am all too familiar with the battle for voice and for inclusion. And so my next poem is called Exiled. I am exiled into the margins of your main everything. I am exiled into the margins of your main everything, estranged in big theater spaces, radio talk shows and TV faces, political discourse and panels that delineate my expansive otherness, exiled in relentless daily press, ignorant headlines and stereotypes that reduce me to less, Privileged, depoliticized art that is blind to my right to exist. I am exiled in your list of forbidden words. Palestine, inaccessible truths, BDS, the right to resist, the right to protest, multi-faith love fests. I am exiled in diversity theatrics and multicultural themes that patronize my dreams of belonging. I am exiled into a hyphen, wedged between two worlds, walled in, yearning for impossible return, aching for acceptance, imprisoned within a skin I did not choose. A faith I inherited, a prayer mat and a headdress and all the familiar foreignness and fear. I am exiled in your fear, imprisoned within a sphere of rights, dispossessed, grief named collateral, a binary of moderate or fanatical, narrating endless wars on terror, exiled in footnotes of imperial conquests, in colonized academic research, and in theories of the West versus the East, the clashing civilizations in your everyday hate speech. I am exiled outside your hole, 
and into invisibility and silence. I am exiled in your silence. The silence to the injustice in the world is what emboldens power structures to transgress against our humanity. Not only with every new war they wage, not only through the exploitation of our planet and the denial of the environmental catastrophe that is taking place, but also in the rising of fascism, both here and really in many of the Western nations today and the rise of racism and nationalism and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. And when you take a few steps back and look at the world, it looks, it looks uh, pretty cruel. And sometimes you get overwhelmed with the what to do and where to from here. And especially our cruelty towards asylum seekers. Um, I can speak about that coming from Australia. So my Australian side of me is actually appalled with the way Australia is treating the asylum seekers. But I think it's important for us as we navigate our way through this disturbing reality that is unfolding around us. It's really important for us to hold a vision of what it is that we are fighting for. It's not enough to stand against oppression if we don't comprehend what standing for justice looks like. And so my last poem, and uh, I'm gonna end with this today, is one that I always like to end my presentations with. It's a vision that I hope that you can hold. Um, the poem is called The Liberation Anthem. And it's dedicated to the Israelis who fear our freedom. And to them I say, don't be afraid, we will liberate you too. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. That day when you and I will stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, watching a new dawn wipe away decades of hate and savagery. The day that I rise from the ashes of your oppression, I promise you, I will not rise alone. You too will rise with me. You will be liberated from your tyranny and my freedom will bring you salvation. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. I'll craft new expressions outside of this suffocating language that has occupied me. Your words, they're like your walls. They encroach on my humanity. I am more than demography. I'm not your terrorist, not your fundamentalist, Islamist, extremist, militant, radical. I am more than adjectives, letters, and syllables. So I will construct my own language and I will defeat your words of power with the power of my words. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. I don't want to obliterate you. I refuse to hate you. I don't care to demonize or proselyze or theorize your intentions. Every breath you draw reminds me you are human. The sound of your beating heart is rhythm familiar to my ears. You and I are no different. We are made of blood and tears. This is my rendition of an anthem to be sung. I will resist and soar above your matrix of control and with the strength of my will, your walls will fall. And this concrete that segregates us we can use it to rebuild homes. Your bulldozers and your tanks will dissolve into the earth. The sap will run in the olive trees. The gates will open wide for the refugees. We will be free. We will be free. And I will be your equal. And only then you will be mine, my other self.
my fellow human being. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Rahaf. I've been introduced before as the director of Sales of the City by the Sea. Um, and I guess the next thing on the schedule is that we've got a little Q&A that um, we're going to open up to the audience. But um, I, I'm going to start with a few questions for Samah and myself. <laughs> um, shall we just begin? Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess in a general sense, uh, what are some of the lessons you've learned about activism on Palestine? General lessons about activism. Look, we've been, uh, I, uh, okay, so I think to start with, just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I was not active until Robert Asseli dragged me into activism. <laughs> <laughs> we were neighbors at the time, and we just moved to Canada. Um, and we, I've been through so many organizations as a volunteer, including I volunteered for the longest time with Canadian Friends of Seville, uh, which landed me on the list of Palestinian Christians on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another story. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the lessons, I think the most important lesson that I would say is, is, is really um, speak your truth. Speak your truth unapologetically. Hold on to what you believe in. Um, don't be dogmatic about it. But at the same time, speak your truth. Tell your story. Uh, and, and be nice to each other. I mean, we've, you know, since the, the, the Arab Spring began, um, I've seen a lot of friendships end because of disagreements. Um, I've seen a lot of people uh, become very edgy with each other. And I, I, I think you really need to always find a way to, to, to be nice to each other and to build on each other's work as opposed to keep on splintering and splintering. And I've seen so many splinters um, in, in 20 years of activism. Um, so, but, but for Palestine specifically, uh, I think be informed and don't be shy about uh, talking to people about Palestine. I, I don't understand it when people say to me, you know, um, this is controversial. What, what is controversial? My, my personal story is controversial. Um, that my parents were, were not allowed to return to their homes, that's controversial. And I find that if you do good work and you do it right and you stand by it, um, that, that you can get a lot further than if you're shy about moving forward. I think a lot of what holds us back is self-censorship to begin with, uh, or the fear that you may not succeed if you, if you put Palestine in, in, in the story. Put it in the story. It is our story. Thanks. <laughs> um, I think I rambled, so. No, that was perfect. Um, so speaking of censorship, um, mm -hmm. I guess, how do you deal with censorship <laughs> and anti-Palestinian sentiments? And then how do you manage through that to make your work so mainstream? I think how I've dealt with censorship has always been taking the position that it's not, um, if it's not right, it, that it should not hold me back. You know, the fear of censorship should not hold me back. It shouldn't be a deterrence. You do your work, you write good, good stuff, or, or, and you, you work within a community. You build your community, and, and, and you just see what happens. Specifically with Tales of a City by the Sea, though, um, it was accused of being an anti-Semitic play, um, which it's anybody who's read it would know it has no mention of Jews or Judaism um, and it doesn't have any Israeli or Jewish characters in it so that, uh, you know it was it was laughable that that they did that but it backfired on the organization it was the Benai Breath in in Australia who led the charge with that and the reason it, it the reason it backfired is because the community we built around the play was a very strong community and the truth was on our side speak your truth um, and so when, when, how do I deal with it? Initially, when the story came out, 
I didn't respond to the media or to their allegations, and I just focused on my craft. I had a beautiful play that I wanted to share with the world. I wasn't going to let their negative and their, their lies really affect it. Um, and I also wanted for other people to stand up and defend it, not me. And sure enough, it was, um, you know, a lot of people wrote letters to the editor. Uh, there was a few opinion pieces. Um, everybody was on side. There was a great support by the Jewish Democratic Society there. Uh, there were a lot of people who <laughs> would be sending me emails saying, look, you know, we're pro israels but we're really embarrassed by this. Because it was an embarrassing thing for, for them to do. Um, but how I dealt with it eventually is when I started talking to the media and they would want to talk um, about the controversy is I would say, I'm not here to talk about what the play isn't. I'd like to talk about what the play is. And the play tells this beautiful love story about two Palestinians in Gaza. And I really want you to come and see it. And it has beautiful, you know, um, humor and, and, and the team, the, the, the production teams put so much effort. I don't want to go around and talk about what it isn't um, it, or what it might be in some sick person's fantasy world, because that's not what it is. So I just focused on my craft. So focus on your craft, do you, your work well, and you will find the community will rally around you. So as, uh, as someone who likes to focus on their craft and who's obviously a very cultural artist with a lot of values and inclusivity, um, how do you feel about the boycott divestment movement? You mentioned it in your poem, so the BDS movement. I'm going to steal Gideon Levy's words and say it's the only game in town. Um, look, the Palestinians need to be able to resist. Um, and this is the most uh, effective and uh, for me, as, as somebody who lives in the diaspora, who lives outside the homeland, this is the way for me to support my people's struggle. It's by embracing uh, a call that was launched by civil society, uh, by the majority of Palestinian civil society groups. Uh, and and they, this is what they're asking us to do here in the comfort of our lives. Uh, it is the least that we can do is to support the boycott, divestments and sanctions. Uh, as an artist, how I reconcile that um, you know, I'm all for artistic freedom and cultural collaboration and all of that. But when you're looking at the impact of Israel's occupation on the ground, um, you understand that sometimes you really have to, uh, you really have to weigh the way you feel about things. And, and so how can we talk about, for example, how can I be talking about cultural freedom when uh, last year the theater was bombed in Gaza? How do I talk about uh, artistic freedom when a poet, a Palestinian poet, um, was put in prison for a poem she wrote uh, and she was held for, for, for months and months without, detained without charges? So how, how do I, as an artist, justify uh, that I can live in a country and, and enjoy the freedoms of the country and enjoy uh, the ability to, to put my art out and to have audiences come when I know that somewhere else, my people are not able to do that. When we put on Tales of a City by the Sea, we were, initially we were hoping that it would open in three countries, uh, in three cities at the same time. So we're supposed to open in Gaza, the West Bank, and Australia at the same, on the same day. And so the three productions began around the same time. We started with the rehearsals and, and you know, we picked our teams and my production manager in Gaza was over the moon that they were gonna put on this Gaza and love story in Gaza. Uh, but what happened is 2014 happened and uh, my production team lost loved ones to the bombing in 2014. Uh, the, the building that uh, my production manager had her office with all her creativity and her reels was destroyed. And so the play was never, this play about Gaza was never actually staged in Gaza. In the West Bank, um, they weren't able to open on the same night as us because there were too many closures and there were curfews and some of the uh, uh, actors couldn't make it to rehearsals on certain days because of, of the situation there. And so with, with everything going on, they opened one week after we did. 
And so to me, that just was telling about how much we take our freedom outside of the homeland for granted. Uh, and so, yeah, I absolutely unequivocally support the boycotts, divestments and sanctions movement and the cultural boycott. Um, as, oh, that's loud. Um, so um, I'm also, obviously also uh, fr coming from exiled refugees and I am also diasporic coming from a diasporic um, ancestry from Palestine. So I guess I, I wanna ask, uh, what is our role as, as diasporic people? As, uh, what's our priority? Um, obviously the BDS movement is one and talking and like being vocal and not being silenced is another, but what, how would you encompass that yourself? I think the Palestinian communities in exile um, need to connect a little bit more um, not be so hard on each other. <laughs> uh, let the youth uh, take some leadership roles. I've, I've seen that happen in, in different places. I've been traveling. And where the youth have taken over the leadership roles of the community, the battles of yesterday were, were not there. They don't care about Hamas and Fatah and factional politics and and those histories, a lot of the young people are, are just ready to, to build their community in exile as hyphenated uh, peoples in exile. So they don't think the same way as my generation um, does. Uh, and so make way for, for young voices or for young people. Celebrate your culture. Be unapologetic about where you come from. Never pass an opportunity to say you're Palestinian. Wear it and wear it with pride. Um, Cass, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, uh, how do you manage to mainstream your work? So, <laughs> uh, okay, so you do good work to start with, um, but nobody, nobody, this doesn't happen overnight. So, you know, my, my, I'll speak specifically from my experience. So I wrote Tales of a City by the Sea, the script. And it took years of uh, workshopping it, two years to be exact, of workshopping the draft with different um, people uh, from, uh, you know, dramaturgs to friends in, from, in the theater, different reads, feedback, focus groups. Then I flew to, we went to Gaza in 2013 and we had a public reading in Gaza of the play. Um, and so this process of perfecting your craft and reworking it and being open to to criticism, this process allows you to build a community around it. So, you know, you're building a community of people who are interested, who want to see how far this work goes. Um, had a public reading at La Mama. Uh, the community got a little bit bigger. Uh, we had a few fundraisers. The community got a little bit bigger. We kept um, expanding that way. And I think with theater especially, uh, you were telling me, we had this conversation a few weeks ago, you know, you were saying the, the words are so beautiful, but with theater, the words are nothing if they are not spoken by the actors and if the director has put an effort into it. And so, you know, with, with writing for theater, you end up creating this baby that everybody has mothered um, and that belongs to everyone. And you, so you're building a bigger community. So how you mainstream your work, you just do it well, you build your community, you don't assume that it's going to be rejected. You assume that you have a right for it to belong to that space. And you just go in there and fight for it to be in that space. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Should I ask? Does, does anyone have any questions for Samah or myself if anyone wants to ask anything? Hi, uh, my questions for either one of you or both. Um, I'm curious about the community here in Toronto that you gathered to put on this play. Um, I guess it's a question for me. Um, so this is my second time around doing this play. Uh, I did this play last year as part of an advanced directing course at University of Toronto. Um, so I guess my community began then. Um, 
And luckily, all the all of my cast members that were involved in the show, well, minus one, unfortunately, but all of them otherwise are involved in some capacity again, whether they're casted again or within the production team. So it did start off last year, but um, it really picked up this year. I, I guess it's just a matter of, of talking and recruiting and, and getting people involved. And I've managed to get about uh, 30 people just in like the program, like just to write, <laughs> just to credit for the show. So, um, and from then it, it's hopefully expanding and expanding and Canadian Friends of Seville have been very helpful in um, marketing and, and getting people to come out and to support. Um, but yes, still growing and still within its initial phases, but I, I'm pretty happy with the community so far that has built around this production. I thank uh, Samah and Canadian Friends of Seville for that. <laughs> Anyone else? First of all, let me thank you for uh, your eloquent presentation. You are a, a superb spokesperson for the Palestinians. Um, as a refugee from Canada uh, to Australia, um, I'm curious if you followed the the last election, or even the election before that in Canada, where uh, the Conservative Party took a very strong pro-Israeli position. They were campaigning if they're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, they wouldn't allow any candidates who were sympathetic to the Palestinians or supported BDS to run. The Liberals took the same position. They wouldn't allow anybody who supported a BDS to, uh, to run as candidates. And the, the few Arabs that did run, a lot of them, at least some of them I know, had to sign a statement saying they did not support BDS. And the NDP was not much better. Uh, there was a, Paul Manley was, was not allowed to run for the NDP in British Columbia, even though his father was a member of parliament for the NDP. And he had gone on the boat to Gaza and was in an Israeli prison for a while. And they complained that Paul was, you know, trying to work too hard to get his father free from an Israeli jail. So they wouldn't let him run. But he did run for the Greens and he got elected in a by-election. He got re-elected last time. So at least the Green Party, while not perfect, they did allow people who supported BDS uh, Dimitri Lascaris is another person that comes to mind. But this is the reality that we have to deal with here. And the, the, you know, the four major parties are completely deaf and in fact suppress any sign of support for the, the Palestinians. And I, what can you suggest that we do to try to to change that and to start at least have a dialogue or get some sort of debate in public? It's an easy question, I'm sure you can answer. <laughs> it's really easy. Uh, look, when it comes to, to the BDS campaign specifically, that's, that's your question. I, I think a lot more needs to be done on the ground in Canada. Look, I'm just flying in for a few days, but my advice would be to build very strong alliances with uh, the American counterparts that you have on BDS. They've ran some amazing campaigns in the US. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded, I'm trying to remember who that teacher was who was fired because she wouldn't sign a contract in her state that said that she supports that she's, uh, that, that she's against BDS. And, and she, do you remember, this was in the somewhere States, in somewhere in Texas. But the point, the moral of that story was, how do you enforce something like that? I mean, it's, it's crazy, it's ridiculous that the government would even think um, of making boycotts uh, illegal in this country. Like, how would you even begin to enforce that? And this is something that's directly targeting each and every one of us' ability to choose at a very personal level what we want to buy and what we want to support and what we want to endorse. It doesn't get more draconian than this. Uh, so the fact that they think they can get away with it really bewilders me. Um, and I would very much advise uh, activists in Canada to really look at the U.S. model and learn from, from the U.S. model. But sorry, I can't really give any more than that. Next question.
No. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm responding to the last poem, and I, uh, which was, you know, very humane. Um, it speaks to the capacity, you know, of, of people to, uh, you know, to care for each other and respect each other. But I think that the task for Israelis and for Jewish people who are supportive of Israel, you know, is, is, is very different, very complex, because one thing they have to deal with is the, is the guilt about doing such horrible things. And um, I'm thinking about the poem by uh, Aharon Shabtai called Shakuz. You know, that, uh, you know, Israel is, is such a dangerous state, both to Palestinians as well as to so many people throughout the world, you know. In, in many ways, it's a highly militarized, highly racist and authoritarian state that, you know, that has a lot of influence now, for instance, in, in borders and in um, militarizing and policing borders and so on. So, you know, you talk about saying, you know, expressing what you feel and what you think and, you know, the, what the reality is. So I, you know, I think that that has to be something that is spoken about over and over again, you know, to confront the, you know, people who are, uh, you know, so much um, uh, um, discrediting that, that reality, that fact. So anyway, that's my, my view. I will take that as a comment. So. Yeah. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to thank you for the extremely moving artistic expression. Um, you're a huge inspiration to me. Um, and you spoke a bit about how um, artistic freedom is repressed and tried to destroy, uh, be destroyed in Palestine. I wanted to know if you know any instances of specifically youth um, using art to resist and to empower themselves in Palestine on the ground. Um, I know of the Freedom Theater over there in uh, Janine refugee camp, um, and I'm very passionate about um, finding artistic ex expression for youth as um, a therapeutic mm. modality. Where, where did you say? Which camp? Uh, Janine. Janine. So I, I don't know about, well, there's the Janine Freedom Theater, and they, yeah. they do work a lot with youth, right? Mm -hmm. But also there's um, an incredible place called the Elder Wad Cultural Center in oh. Ida Refugee Camp, and they run all kinds of courses and workshops, art, um, photography, acting, singing, music. Uh, so that's, that's really a, a worthwhile place to look at as well. And there are so many others, but these are the two that just came to mind. Thank you. Uh, over. <laughs> There's someone over here as well. Hello. I'm curious to know more about the role of Palestinian Christians in their solidarity with other Palestinians against colonization and occupation. From my understanding, Palestinian Christians have been looked at as a more neutral, benign uh, uh, community that either didn't have a position or was supportive of Israel um, passively or, or implicitly. Um, I'm curious to know more about um, your position and where it stands for Palestinian Christians in general in terms of how they view um, the, the situation of colonization and occupation. Did Robert or Rahafia, yeah, one of you? I'm just speaking from my, um, my experience with Canadian friends of Sabil and having uh, lived there and, and served in, um, in Gaza and the West Bank for, uh, for three years, the um, Middle East Council of Churches. Uh, the Palestinian Christians in Palestine are 100% on board with the struggle. Um, they make no bones uh, across the board that, um, that uh, they're on board with the nonviolent struggle and they've issued uh, documents like the uh, Kairos, uh, Kairos Palestine 
call um, wh whose anniversary is tomorrow, and tomorrow is the is the meeting of um, uh, Kairos Palestine. People from all over the uh, uh, all over the world are, are going to be in Bethlehem uh, tomorrow because the um, uh, Palestinian Christians are are not not only one hundred percent behind the movement for liberation, but um, a big part out in front. Also, just a quick note, uh, speaking as a Palestinian Christian, um, there's actually quite an explicit erasure of Palestinian Christians, um, oftentimes within the narrative. Uh, usually this is um, to serve a very uh, Orientalist um, uh, depiction of the occupation and the colonization, which is that there um, is a very European kind of state in the Middle East and it's surrounded by um, you know, what tend to be depicted as barbaric Muslim neighbors. Um, and so there's, it's quite an intentional um, erasure of the Christians in Palestine and of the movements um, of Christians in Palestine. Sabil, uh, uh, Sabil Jerusalem comes to mind. And so um, just to kind of note that as well, is that sometimes you don't hear those voices um, in the protests and in the rallies as part of an intentional, um, as part, it's very intentional. Can I, can I add something? Sure. Okay. Um, also, as a Palestinian Christian, um, I wanted to say that the, I, I personally don't see, um, I see this erasure. I see this erasure of, of Palestinian Christians um, to enforce the colonialist idea of um, this being a religious war. Um, of this being a, a Islamic versus uh, Jewish war, but it is not, it's, it's much more than that. Um, so there is, yeah, so there is an erasure of this, uh, of, of who Palestinian Christians are and, and uh, how, how big of a community we are. Um, but it, we are like, from what I know, we are very, um, we stand with our, our Islamic Arab friends, as, because it is a it's a fight for both of us. It's not we're no different. Yeah, the occupation does not really differentiate if you're a Palestinian Muslim or if you're a Palestinian Christian. Or a Palestinian. Right. We have another question here. This is just a very short question, um, but uh, so I loved your, your poetry was powerful. I'm just wondering, is it published in a, a book somewhere that we can get access to? Uh, two of the poems are in the book, I Remember My Name, uh, and it's available online. You can buy it. I Remember My Name is the title of the book. Uh, the Exiled and the Gaza One are new poems that I've written since that book was published. So they're not available. Will you publish them? Eventually. <laughs> you can't skip the director's mother. She well, keeps raising her hand. I'm going to, I'm sorry, but there is uh, <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> Samah, thank you very much. You really inspired us tonight. Um, one of the things that resonated in my, in my heart when I was a student was uh, for us to be able to watch uh, plays uh, with my classmates mm -hmm. on TV. So um, I, I was wondering, uh, are you considering... Um, this for Tales of a City by the Sea or any of your plays, I mean, for it to be a global um, broadcasted play for, for a bigger target, a global target? That's a tough one because we grew up, um, or at least I'll speak for myself, I grew up with a black and white TV initially and we did watch plays, Red Laham, Feirouz, uh, Egyptian plays, and we loved them, but we had different eyes. Uh, today's generation, they, they, they don't see things the same way. They're not going to be as happy just watching a flat screen with a, a flat stage. I've recorded all the productions that we've put on, and I hopefully will record this one as well. 
but I, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think uh, I would be able to put it out. But maybe one day the film, Rahab, yeah, how would you feel say, about yeah. directing? I'm asking you now, would you like to direct the movie <laughs> Tales of a City by the Sea? I have no film experience. But we'll pass on. the hat and you can all donate to the multi-million dollar production. I see this as a film for sure. Yeah. Um, so I took some comfort perhaps in, in your description of the settler colonial project as a failing one. Um, I guess I need to try and understand how much will that eventual failure be driven by the changing demographics and faces um, of the societies that we are in today, which provide so much material support for that project? I don't know how much. I can't really look into the crystal ball, but it's definitely going to have an impact, and the impact is definitely increasing. Uh, we are, uh, the world is changing in, in that sense, and the Palestinian communities in diaspora uh, have produced some very incredible people. And I even just look at the young generation that's here today and, and listen to the articulate um, spokespeople we have here. So yes, it, it will have an impact. But I think, I think it's really important to know that it is the work that is being done on the ground that is going to really determine things in the end. Uh, and I think that for as long as Palestinian sumud and resistance continues, uh, and it will continue, we, I mean, it's incredible that they get up every morning and still resist. And, and we draw our strengths and our inspiration from them. And so I'm, uh, I, I see that the role is important and, and, um, I'm not downplaying how important our role in diaspora and a solidarity group is in, in supporting um, the end of Israel's apartheid regime. Uh, but at the same time, I understand and I know that at the end of the day, change will happen over there from the inside. Hello, thank you so much for the wonderful poetry. Uh, and there is power in art, no question. I do want to ask you how you feel about the following statement, especially talking about the role of Palestinians in the diaspora. Because um, we have a role, let's say, as activists and so on. But truly, should not the role be that we should make friends for Palestine? Mm -hmm. That is our job. That is everybody's job, not just the activist among us. Every Palestinian should be out there with a view to making friends for Palestine, because that is within the reach of every person. It's part of their humanity. Robert, is that, is that you, Robert Massoud? You're yes. just a little bit far, so I can't. Thanks. It is you. Everybody, this guy, olive oil, for years. <laughs> And speaking of people I've volunteered to do work for, for the longest time, we had hundreds of olive oil bottles in our house in Kanata, and I would have my poor husband here drive around to deliver them. I think your work exemplifies what you're saying and, and what I was saying before, which is find what you're good at, do it well, and don't be afraid to put Palestine on it as a name. And, and, and Robert's idea of bringing olive oil, zatun from uh, Palestine and then packaging it and selling it um, here and with it the story of the olive trees and the story of Palestine. That has gone such a long way and I congratulate you and I just want to acknowledge that right here. Um, and yes, I think just, uh, I mean, it's not that we're, uh, we're, we're going out to convert people. You're just, you, just be who you are and and people it's amazing in australia despite the fact that we have a horrible government um all the polls have shown and that more than 70 percent of australians support palestine i mean the ground has shifted 
uh, people's opinions have shifted. The governments are not reflective of this, but we have to be able to actually um, use this power that we have on the ground. And it's the power of the story at the end of the day. I mean, anyone who finds out what happened, I, mean, I was writing, you know, about the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. And I, one of the students at the universities was reading my notes and going, how did they get away with this? You know? <laughs> and really, so just it's the power of the story and it's doing great projects um, like the project Robert is doing, like uh, the work of Canadian Friends of Sibyl uh, and, and just help each other through that way. And, and by the way, I think I should also point Khalid is here, Can, Canadian Arab Federation, um, past president. I don't know who else I'm picking in the crowd. Can I just introduce our next questioner? Can you stand up, Saja? Saja is our lead in Tales of a City by the Sea, so I hope you guys come out and watch her do an incredible job play Jumana. And she will make you cry. <laughs> and she has last year if you came to see the show. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this extraordinary um, speech that you've just given. I also want to give attention to the beautiful poem that you um, started with words um, and telling the truth. Um, ever since, since I moved to Canada, I've been always told to steer away from talking about Palestine because it's so controversial. And, um, and luckily I have parents that have supported me and told me to follow my passion and speak my truth. But what advice would you give students that are being told today to steer away from a topic that is so sensitive as this one? I think it's only sensitive when we agree that it's sensitive. You know, we create our own reality in, in many ways. Um, and I've, I've noticed this about Canadian activism in general, is that I've come from, he, from, from Canada activism background and then went to Australia. In Australia, I mean, it, people are very direct and straightforward and, and the, 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 I don't know, should I call it timidity that comes with wanting to be polite here in Canada is, is, is not there. And what that allowed me to do is to really, like when I talk about decolonizing your words and your approach, I've been able to, to do that with just by being frank and honest and true to myself uh, and not doubting myself. And so I would say to students in, in, in universities, Palestine is not controversial. What should be controversial is the idea that Palestine is controversial. Um, and so speak about Palestine. And, and if anybody tells you this is sensitive, just face them and say, why is this sensitive? This is just where I come from. You know, is it sensitive to say I'm Canadian? Is it sensitive to say, uh, so just don't be afraid. I think a lot of the time it's self-censorship, it's fear of consequence. But if, if you break out of that, there is such a, a liberating feeling that comes with it. Um. I, I guess I'm just going to say my personal narrative with this because I, I also came to Canada um, and I was scared to, to call myself Palestinian because of the controversy or, or whatever I felt back then. But even last year when I first proposed this play, I felt like I was doing this like very risky thing. Um, and just writing a, this proposal to, to put this play up was so hard to word. And, and I have to say that the more I invested and the more I taught myself and the more I, I like really looked into the history and in the past and um, into my truth, the more it became easier and easier and easier it was to just claim, claim my identity. Um, even like just looking at the first proposal I wrote to my director's note by the time the show came up, it, it really, really felt liberating. And, and the, I think where Palestinians in the diaspora feel um, this self-censorship is, is, and this is something I will admit to myself, is our ignorance on our own history. So I think it just has to do with uh, really digging into the research and making sure it's credible and making sure that our history is, um, is, is factual. Um, and once you realize that, that it's, it's the truth and it's okay and that then then you will only like you must recognize yourself in order for others to recognize you and it's just yeah. the way it is and that's a really good point. 
That's really a good point about credible. Just make sure you know your facts and that you can back them. Uh, and congratulations to you for, for breaking out of that fear and for putting it on at university. Well done. Any more questions? Oof. How, how many more questions can we take? I just had a question about the, there was a comment earlier in one of the introductions. Um, we were, uh, it was, uh, the play was described as, uh, it, or it was like encouraging some of the people here to, uh, you know, to bring people and, uh, and watch the play. And because it's, uh, I guess, I'm not sure if the exact wording was what it was meant, but it was a soft introduction to Palestine. Uh, and uh, not to worry, there won't be any arguments over dinner table and things like that. So I, I'm wondering, is that, wh wh what do you think about that? Like, do we not, is that something that we don't want? And I mean, is that even a good description of the play? No, I think, I think what Robert was, was saying is that uh, plays in general, entertainment things in general, are things that you can take everybody to. If you were to say to someone, I'm going to go and listen to a lecture about the impact of the siege on the people of Gaza, probably they're not going to come. Your neighbors or your workmates are going to find better ways to spend their evenings. But if you tell them, we're going to go see a Palestinian love story um, with music, and you know, it's won a few awards, it's being taught in schools in Australia, come and see it. Uh, then you have more likelihood to bring them in. So the approach is soft. He's not saying that the play itself or its impact or, or, the, or that it won't open minds. He's just saying this is something that you can actually bring people to. Uh, now, I don't deliberately do that with my art. I have to put it out there. Uh, I, I'm with my plays with this one and the one before it. I just wanted to honor the experiences of the people and raise them above the politics. Being a Palestinian is within itself political. Uh, and so you can't really say this play is not political. But what this play isn't is it doesn't get lost in political discourse. Uh, and what it does is it highlights the, the, the impossibility of having normal lives in Gaza under the siege. But it does this through a love story one that you and your friends and your neighbors will hopefully come see and enjoy, if that's the right word. <laughs>